follow me. Please. Follow me. Please. Ta -da -da. Ta -da -da. <laughs> In this video, we're going to talk about the principles of hydrometeorological phenomena. The learning competency for this video is to distinguish and differentiate among and between different hydrometeorological phenomena or hazards. At the end of the video, you should be able to explain the mechanisms, formation of different hydrometeorological phenomena, and distinguish between different hydrometeorological hazards. Let's start with the definition of hydrometeorology. Hydrometeorology is the study of atmospheric and terrestrial phases of the hydrological cycle with emphasis on the interrelationship between them. The water cycle is shown here. So basically, hydrometeorology deals with the transfer of water and energy between land surface and the lower atmosphere. Okay, so here we're going to discuss how rain is generated and what happens when it reaches its surface. Okay, ready? Let's start. When is that ever okay? Because the hydrological cycle is a cycle, it does not necessarily have a starting or ending point. But to be organized, we're going to follow a certain flow. We'll start with the precipitation. Under this, we have cloud formation and type, rainfall associated hazards, followed by the formation of snow-covered mountaintops and melting of snow and ice, which do not happen in some places, so we will not linger on these two. Next is the interception of precipitation by vegetation cover, followed by storage in land surface depressions, infiltrations of water into soil, evapotranspiration, recharge of groundwater, and finally, river runoff. Okay? That was a lot! Let's start with the clouds. Clouds are so common that most of the time, people do not pay attention to it. There are cloud appreciation societies worldwide that encourage people to look at clouds. One of the well-known society is the Cloud Appreciation Society, which is an organization founded in the United Kingdom. The scientific magazine Science Focus also published an article about the top seven most beautiful clouds. And on the sixth spot is the Alto Cumulus Lenticularis in New Zealand. So Lenticularis are orographic clouds, meaning they result from the interaction between wind and raised terrain like mountains. So this display was caused by the Southern Alps of New Zealand's South Island. So why are clouds important? Well, I don't know, darling. What do you think? <laughs> clouds are essential in the hydrologic cycle of Earth because their formation and movement initiates the transport of water. So just to define, a cloud is a visible aggregate of small water droplets and or ice particles in the atmosphere above Earth's surface. And they form in the atmosphere as a result of condensation of water vapor rising from the surface. There are 10 general types of cloud, and they are classified depending on their height. We have low, mid, and high appearance, and their corresponding precipitation. So for this video, we're just going to focus on the height. And as we discuss this classification, we will be able to describe their appearance and the precipitation. First, we have the low clouds. They are clouds with a height of less than 2 kilometers. We have four types under this category, and the first one is the cumulus clouds. They are individual dense clouds with sharp outlines and often develop vertically. Okay, so their name actually came from the Latin prefix cumulo, meaning heap or pile. So they are described as cotton-like or fluffy. Next is the stratus cloud. It is described as a gray cloud layer with a uniform base, which may produce drizzle if it's thick enough. They are produced by a column of rising air in the lower altitudes of the Earth's atmosphere, or what we call thermal. So its name came from a Latin prefix strato, meaning layers. 
Next, we have the stratocumulus. So it's like the combination of the first two. So this type of cloud is described as gray or whitish sheet of layered clouds with regularly arranged small cloud elements. Next one is the cumulonimbus. Now remember this one because we're going to talk about this. So this is also called as the thunderstorm cloud. This is a heavy and dense cloud in the form of a tall tower. So the base of this cloud is often dark and produced precipitation. That's why this cloud produces hail or tornado. The middle clouds are clouds with height between 2 kilometers and 7 kilometers. And we have three types under this category, the altocumulus, nimbostratus, and the altostratus. Now, the altocumulus clouds look like this. So they are described as a sheet of layered clouds composed of rounded masses or rolls. Next is the nimbostratus, which is described as a gray cloud layer covering the sky with continuous falling rain, followed by the altostratus. So it is a cloud, a gray cloud sheets of fibrous clouds that totally or partially covers the sky, but thin enough to reveal the sun. So those are the three middle clouds. Now let's go to the high clouds, which are clouds with height greater than 7 kilometers. And we also have three kinds. First is the cirrus cloud. Okay, so they are clouds in the form of white, delicate filaments. They have fibrous and or silky sheen appearance. Next, we have the cirrostratus. They are transparent, white veil clouds with a fibrous appearance. Next, we have the cirrocumulus. So this is described as thin white sheet or layer of clouds without shading. Now, we also have the term nimbus. You have seen this in the names a while ago. Nimbus refers to rain-producing clouds. Hence, the two general type of rain-producing clouds have the words nimbus in it. First, we have the cumulonimbus. Cumulonimbus clouds form on hot and humid days. So these are again thunderstorm clouds and usually precipitates in the afternoon or evening. This is associated with lightning and thunder. They are brief but carry or bring intense rain. They also have gusty winds. The next type of cloud is the nimbostratus. Nimbostratus clouds generally form from frontal systems. It is usually the tail end of the cold front weather system that affects the northern Luzon and eastern Luzon in the Philippines. So this is described by overcast conditions with cold temperature. Nimbostratus clouds may carry with them continuous light to moderate rain, which could lead to water-saturated surfaces. Remember that clouds are associated with different types of precipitation. That is why distinguishing between cloud types is important because it can give us a glimpse of an impending hydrometeorological hazard. Now, how do we measure the rain that these types of clouds pour? Rainfall is measured using a rain gauge. Rainfall is measured using a rain gauge. A rain gauge is thought to be one of the oldest weather instruments. Rain gauges can be as simple as a cylinder, as you can see here in this figure. Okay, so the height of rainwater that collects in the cylinder is the measured amount of rainfall. So this is usually in milliliters. So all of the things that we have discussed are the atmospheric phase of the hydrologic cycle. Now let's talk about the terrestrial phase of the hydrologic cycle. No, spoil, no, no more. <laughs> okay. Stop here. Come okay. Man. As water returns to the surface of the earth from precipitation, it doesn't just stay in one place. Okay? Gravity takes it to the ground either as infiltration or it begins running downhill as surface runoff.
So what is an infiltration? What is a surface runoff? Before we discuss those two, let's talk about the processes that govern terrestrial water flow. So these are the processes that govern the terrestrial flow. First is the interception of precipitation by vegetation cover. Intercept means to obstruct someone or something so as to prevent them from continuing, right? So interception of precipitation refers to precipitation that does not reach the soil but is instead intercepted by the leaves, branches of plants, and the forest floor. Next is the storage in land surface depression. It is the detention of a part of precipitation on depressions. Now, while most water flows back to the ocean, some can flow in streams toward a closed lake or purposely diverted for human use and stored there for a time. Next is the infiltration of water into soil. Infiltration is the flow of water through the soil surface. Now the rate now the rate of infiltration is affected by the property of the soil, such as texture, structure, and moisture content. This figure shows how water infiltrates different types of soil. A sandy soil is the easiest to infiltrate. So the water just flows directly here. Okay? Followed by a silt, but clays are the hardest to infiltrate. Now, soil profiles or vertical organizations of different soil layers and the depth of the soil column also influence the hydrologic process as infiltrations will vary with different soils. Next, we have the evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is the movement of water from oceans or land to the atmosphere through the combined process of evaporation and transpiration. It is also defined as the total evaporation from surface water and plants. It is called the total evaporation because evaporation and transpiration involve a change in state from liquid to water vapor, which requires input of energy. Now, in most terrestrial basins, transpiration is the dominant process by which water moves from Earth's surface to the atmosphere, whereas over lakes and oceans, evaporation dominates. Next, we have the recharge of groundwater. Okay, so this one. Groundwater recharge or deep drainage or deep percolation is a hydrologic process where water moves downward from surface water to groundwater. Groundwater is recharged naturally by rain and snow melt and to smaller extent by surface water. So for example, rivers and lakes. Recharge, however, may be affected somewhat by human activities including paving, development, or logging. Okay, so this process is followed by river runoff. River runoff refers to all water that comes into a river water system from sources such as groundwater, which we have discussed a while ago, rainfall, and snow melt. Now we have discussed what happens to water when it returns to the surface of the earth when it is pulled by gravity. Okay, so this is infiltration. Now let's talk about what happens when it begins running downhill. So we call this the surface runoff. <sighs> So, surface runoff is the flow of water over land surfaces. Now, the size of the basin or the contributing area of the rainfall in a basin has a significant influence on the amount of runoff. Consider the two similarly shaped basins, but this one is larger. Okay? So, runoff starting from a further distance will take a longer time to reach the outlet of the watershed than the one starting from a shorter distance okay 
So a watershed is a basin-like landform defined by high points and ridge lines that descend into lower elevation and stream valleys. Suppose there is a local heavy rainfall event, okay, for example, a super typhoon. Now, this typhoon will only affect a small portion of a big basin, for example, this part only, okay? So, this is the only affected area. But, this same event can cover the whole of a small basin. For example, this one. Okay? So, this could lead to severe flooding or flush flood. Aside from the size, the shape of a basin also has influence on the magnitude and timing of the flow of water along the basin outlet. So, consider these two basins of the same size, but one is round. This one, almost round. So, the other is long and narrow. Suppose water is coming from the farthest point in each of the basins. So, water will flow quicker for the round basins and the water will likely converge in the outlet at the same time. Okay, so they will go here. When that happens, you will have a greater peak flow. So more water will go here at the same time, which could lead to flooding. Now the narrower basin, on the other hand, water from multiple locations is less likely to arrive at the same time, resulting in a lower peak flow. So this here, you can have it here and you can have it here. So the water from this side will go earlier compared to the water from here and from here. In connection to this, the slope of the basin is also an important factor to consider, not only for surface runoff, but infiltration as well. So the pull of the gravity. Remember, the steeper the slope, the lower the infiltration rate because gravity pulls less water into the land surface. The water will most likely just become surface runoff. On the other hand, a gentle incline would have higher infiltration rate. So in the next video, we're going to talk about hydrometeorological hazards.